Welcome back to Camera West TV. My name is Carlo, and on today's episode of Thumbprints and Signatures, we're taking a look at the Leica 28mm f1.4 Sumalux. Pretty big lens. So a little backstory about this lens. Back in early 2015 or so, it was released as part of a special edition set and aesthetically it had a retractable circular hood. In the later half of 2015, they released it as part of the main production line. So now we have the lens that you see in front of you today. Prior to the release of this lens, there was a gap in the wide angle Sumalux line. So we had the 21 and 24 millimeter Sumaluxes released in 2008. And then we also had the pre-FLE 35 millimeter Sumalux. Uh, we did a thumbprints and signatures episode on the FLE versions of the 35 millimeter Sumalux. You can check that out up here, but anyway, Back to this lens. The introduction of this Sumalux specifically was a huge upgrade from its predecessor, the F2 Sumacron. And I'll tell you a little secret of why. It's all thanks to what we call a FLE or, you know, floating lens element, but they don't call it an FLE. It just says floating element on their website, but we all know what that means. And we cover this in our 35 millimeter FLE episode. And so, like I said, go check that one out. Much like the 35 Sumalux FLE, the floating element in this lens does help with optimum performance at minimum distances. So that ensures sharpness even at your closer distances. And it's also advertised to have a minimal to virtually no distortion. So we're out here in Mission Bay. Um, they kind of redeveloped this whole area and there's plenty of high rises and kind of nice light here. So I wanted to use the 28 Sumalux and kind of showcase what it looks like at 1.4. I'm using the M11 and I'm gonna utilize the hybrid electronic shutter in this camera. I say hybrid because when you go past the 4,000th of a second or 1 4,000th of a second, it automatically kicks in. So that's just so I don't have to use an ND filter because otherwise I would need a like series filter that screws on underneath the hood. And I don't really wanna do that. So we're gonna stick to ISO 64 and utilize all this bright light and kind of see what kind of shallow depth of field we can get at f1.4. A lot of seagulls over here. What is that? Windmill? Duck windmill? And then I focus kind of further away to give you an idea of like how much spatial depth you get at f1.4 from close to medium to far. Also when that uh, electronic shutter kicks in, you can't really hear the camera, so it's kind of hard to tell if I take a photo sometimes. So one of the biggest elephants in the room for this lens is obviously its size. And as you can see, it does kind of block part of the viewfinder. And so if you are trying to compose a frame kind of like right here, a good quarter of the bottom of the right side of the viewfinder will be blocked off. I feel like that's not too much of an issue. I wear glasses, so I already can't see the 28 millimeter frame lines fully. So as long as I'm kind of looking around and paying attention to what is in the composition, you know, generally you can make sure that you're getting what you need in your frame. But also if you have an EVF or a 28 millimeter finder, or even if you wanted to use live view for digital cameras, that can also help you in this case. So so far it's not too big of an issue. They put like a little cutout window right there so you can somewhat see, but the lens does protrude far enough out to where it does block the finder a bit. So this lens has a minimum focusing distance of 0.7 meters, which is kind of far for a wide angle lens. Uh, you know, from basically here to here, you're getting a lot more in your frame. So if you wanted to take some, you know, nice flower photos, I think you would need 
a lot more flowers to kind of make the scene much more appealing. Otherwise, you're just gonna have kind of a standalone flower sitting in there. But, you know, at least the colors look nice. So the signature of this lens is obviously going to be a more modern representation of Leica lenses. You do have a very clinical look in terms of the colors, how it handles contrast, and even the way that it flares. There's almost no flaring on this lens with some exceptions. But the draw to this lens is its low depth of field and high sharpness in the focal plane. And what this means is that you're able to isolate your subjects in a way that gives it more atmospheric space. So when you're looking at environments or just, you know, even places where you just have a lot of busyness going around, you're able to kind of isolate your subjects in kind of its own plane of focus and have everything kind of fall off around it, creating a big sense of depth in your photos. And obviously stop down, it's going to perform much like modern M lenses. The color rendition is pretty accurate. What you see is how it's going to render. This lens is also known for its heavy vignetting and purple fringing in the highlights, which to me is kind of reminiscent of the 50 f1 Noctilux, which has its own imperfections that give the lens a unique character. But if you find those traits distracting, you can easily correct that in post. So the benefit of having a 28 millimeter lens paired with a 1.4 aperture is it allows you to get in close and fill your frame, or you can step back and get more of your environment. Now, you might be wondering, well, what if I just want a 50 and a 35 and that's all I need? Or I want to get wider and I want to do a 21 or a 24. Now those are all great options. But with this lens, there's virtually no distortion. So when you start going into the 24 and wider, you're gonna start seeing some type of distortion. And then when you go into 35 and 50, you find yourself stepping back further than you would like, or you just run out of space. So having a lens that also goes to f1.4, it allows you to think of your environments and spaces in a new way that allows you to create more. I had a lot of fun using this lens, and I enjoyed having the 1.4 aperture. It has a great way of drawing attention to your subjects or whatever you focus on, mostly with the vignetting, almost like a tunnel vision effect. Up close, the bokeh is very smooth, and it has a nice transition from what is in focus. I also found when I was further away from my subjects, the 28 millimeter focal length mixed with the shallow depth of field truly made me think more about my compositions or what I wanted to focus on or how I intentionally wanted to make a photo. The flaring on this lens is pretty well controlled. It has a removable screw on metal hood, but I also think the sensor of the M11 contributed to some of that flare control, so I don't know if that's a fair comparison, but I will say the flares do look pretty pleasing. And like I said, this lens does have significant vignetting, especially wide open, but I don't think that's a big deal. I kind of like the tunnel vision effect that this lens produces, but obviously you can correct that in post. The colors are what you would expect from a modern M lens, but it does offer a good amount of purple fringing in the highlights, which if you're not a fan of, you can correct in post, or you can use it as a bit of creative flair. This lens was extremely helpful at night and it allowed me to make handheld photos without the need of a tripod. And I was even able to capture some stars and constellations even though I couldn't avoid shaking and causing some motion blur. The viewfinder blockage wasn't a huge deal to me. I think the more you get to use the lens or any lens that blocks the viewfinder, you start to pre-visualize what would be in that part of the frame and just account for that. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the size and weight of this lens is probably one of the biggest trade-offs where you either can go for the extra stop of light or if you don't need the extra stop of light, you can go down to the Summicron or F2 version and have a smaller, more compact, lighter setup. So you kind of have to pick your battle there. If you need a stop of light, go with the Summilux. If you are perfectly happy with the size and capabilities of the Summicron, then go with the Summicron. And I also can't forget to mention the price point of this lens. It's expensive. So if you find yourself wanting to upgrade to this lens, I think if you need the 1.4 aperture and you want the benefit of having a distinct look from the Summicron, then I think it's worth upgrading. But you also have to keep in mind with the upgrade, you get the increase in size and weight and you just get an overall bigger lens. But from a technical standpoint, 
If you're working mostly with 35 millimeter film, I think the extra stop light makes more sense. And maybe not so much for digital. This also begs the question if the extra stop of light is beneficial. With digital sensors getting better and better with low light capabilities year after year, that almost makes you wonder if we're ever gonna need a 1.4 lens. No, we're still gonna want a 1.4 lens. No one's gonna wanna say no to a Sumalux. I mean, look at this thing, it's beautiful. And this wraps up another episode of Thumbprints and Signatures. I really wanna thank you guys for watching. Let me know down in the comments what you think of the 28 millimeter Sumalux. Do you love it? Do you hate it? What do you think about F2 versus F1.4? Is F1.4 even worth it? Let me know down below. Don't forget to head over to likeastoresf.com or camerawest.com to check out our large inventory of pre-owned products. You never know, you might just find a 28 Sumalux for a pretty good deal. And don't forget to head over to the blog portion of our website to check out the full images and full blog posts. It's mostly just what I say in these videos, transcribed, and you get to look at the photos at your own pace. Thank you again for checking out this video and don't forget to like and subscribe. My name's Carlo and I'll see you next time.